good day. Welcome back to Live Well with Aromatherapist Jerby Cole. Health is the fuel for creating a magical life. Today, let's hear it from Magic Barclay. A cancer, Lyme disease, stroke, diabetes, heart attack, and hypoxia survivor. Magic has seen how treating root cause of any illness gives you the tools to acquire a level of health you only dreamed of. Magic is a mold toxicity master practitioner, an expert in the PNEI psycho neuroendoimmunology of trauma, an advanced immune practitioner, and an advanced practitioner in innate immunity and functional health solutions. She believes that treating the body and mind with holism is important. Magic is also a practitioner of lymphatic mojo and CMLD complex manual lymphatic drainage. Magic is the author of four books and a sought-after speaker. Everybody, please welcome Magic Barkley. So hello, Magic. How are you? I'm great. How are you? I'm good. It's a little sunny here. How about there in Australia? No, it's nine degrees Celsius, cold and cloudy. Oh my gosh, I'm jealous. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's dive right in. I saw your um, bio. Very interesting. You have a lot of um, titles under your belt. And some of which are, I got very curious. What do you mean by mold toxicity master practitioner? Like, how do you become one? It's my first time to hear about it. Okay, so there's a lot of study into it. But basically, I treat mold within the body. So I use some products to help clean the home and get rid of it from the surroundings. But, you know, just by cleaning the surroundings, cleaning the home doesn't mean you're free of mold. And mold is the great survivor. So toxicity in the body is a big thing. And you know what? One of the best things to use to treat it is certain essential oils. So I just love the versatility of oils and, you know, the medicinal properties that they can have. Amazing. Let's get onto that later. But I'm curious, how does mold, how does mold affect the body and why is it so dangerous? It's really dangerous because it's an immunosuppressor. It's the immunosuppressor. So mold is known as the great survivor. Uh, it's used in warfare, it's used in medicine because it survives. That's what it does. And it doesn't care if the host is still alive because it's a decomposer. So it's decomposing you to the point where if you died from the toxicity of it, it just moves on to the next thing. So we see that often in gardens. You know, you lift up a rock, it's a bit moldy, and you think, well, that's nothing. Well, it's actually doing a lot of work there. And it does the same thing inside you, but not to your betterment, unfortunately. So basically you can inhale it, you can ingest it. Most commonly it's inhaled from spores in the home or the surroundings, the workplace, whatever. And once it does that, it shuts down your immune capabilities, completely cloaks them, and it pulls the strings. So it uh, creates limbic or emotional reactions to things. Uh, it creates internal reactions with the other systems of the body to certain situations, to certain foods, thoughts, anything, temperatures. It just has its own world. And once it's in you, you are its world. So it's really important to get it back into a latent state, get it out of the body and make sure it knows that you're in, you're in charge, you're in control, and that it's not. Because if you don't, it could be a death sentence. Is it the same as the mold that's being um, cultivated in making cheese? Similar. So there's 37 types of mold. They're not all bad. The most common one that we know in our homes is black mold. You know it because you see it, but there's also white molds, pink molds, you know, lots of different molds. Like I said, they're not all bad, but it's the bad ones that you really do have to watch. We've been fairly intelligent, I guess, as humans to be able to use mold to do things like make cheese but to what extent is that healthy for us i'm not saying cheese isn't a healthy option for some people it's not for some people it may be but you know you have to understand how mold works and that it doesn't just stop doing one job because you said it should just make cheese so you know it really depends on the type of mold 
That is true. And I, I've read that some molds can be very fatal. Yeah, especially black mold. So, yeah, in humid climates, even here where I am in Australia, it's not humid. It's a temperate zone, um, you know, it's freezing during winter. But we've built new houses so that they're airtight. Well, that's not what you should be doing. So you've got heaters or air conditioners or something going. You're creating condensation. You're creating different areas where mold loves to breed. We have bathrooms. Well, guess what? Mold loves bathrooms because it's nice and warm and sticky and, you know, same as inside your body, it loves that. So we really need to look at how we're living, making sure that we have airflow, even in the dead of winter, that you have a couple of windows slightly ajar so that you've got some airflow coming through and, you know, that you're making sure that areas that are breeding grounds like kitchens, bathrooms, air conditioning units, heating units, that they're clean because if you don't, you're the next unit that the mold's going to like. Magic, could you please share with our audience, how can you, what's the best way to get rid of these molds to clean or maintain? I use products that are designed here in Australia from a company called San Air. Um, they have all the literature, documentation, testing, everything, data behind their products. I use those and I prescribe those to my clients. Um, they have wearable technology, which incorporates some essential oils. And uh, then I have my mold toxicity program, which is quite involved. And it really depends on how affected the client might be with mold toxicity. So, you know, again, I can't really say blanket. This is what I do. It just depends on the person. Amazing. How about the role of essential oils in managing or mitigating these molds? Well, essential oils are probably one of the most unrecognized tools we have in our toolbox of health. And that is because they are so fine in particles that they can cross the cell barriers, the blood-brain barrier. Nothing else can do that apart from the nasties like toxic heavy metals so essential oils are on the flip side and they're our friends as long as they're good reputable brands and there's not many of those out there so be careful not all oils are oils okay but basically all oils are antimicrobial so they're antifungal they're antiparasitic they're antiviral they're antibacterial okay so that incorporates mold because mold is a fungus well, from that family anyway. So essential oils can get into the cells. They're intracellular because they're so microscopic and they get into the cells and they can target the nasties and they can boost your health. So they do two things. They break down the things that they need to break down and they build up the things that they need to build up. Certain essential oils are better for certain conditions. So, you know, for someone that might be losing their hair, for example. We might prescribe rosemary to be rubbed onto the scalp with a carrier oil because we know that rosemary has um, great properties in the conversion of uh, testosterone to estrogen, right? So that's one use. Rosemary is great also in your food. If you don't have fresh herbs and you've got a good quality ingestible rosemary oil, you can use that in your food. Okay, but we know that rosemary, when it's diffused as well, is a mold fighter. When it's teamed up with thyme, it's teamed up with clary sage, and it's teamed up with peppermint, the four of them together, mold particles or mold spores, don't like to reproduce when they smell those four oils together. So, you know, this is something that I try to teach my clients that you don't need to know what every oil does, they are all antimicrobial okay but some of them have some other uses that are really really cool lavender for example liquid stitches if you cut yourself and you have nothing in your first aid kit because you didn't restock it or maybe you don't have a first aid kit you have a bottle of lavender oil you can put some on the cut and it's almost going to instantly seal it it's going to protect it from any infections and it will actually encourage the skin to seal over Lavender also is very calming and relaxing. So when you're stressed out, you can just have a bit of a sniff of some lavender and you're automatically at ease. 
So essential oils are misunderstood. They are not given the recognition that they really deserve. And, you know, there's so many different oils, but you don't need to know what every single one of them does. I was actually waiting for you to mention thyme. I'm happy that you did. <laughs> and I agree with, you, with what you said that, you know, these oils are very powerful. They are antimicrobial, while some of them can be um, more hardworking because they have other properties. But yes, a lot of them are really um, effective in managing molds and all of these um, fungus, especially thyme, actually. Um, it's one of the powerhouse. And I'm glad that you shared that with our audience. Moving and on, just, I- just on time, sorry to cut you off there, but just on time, a lot of people have an aversion to the smell of it, right? And there's a reason why you have an aversion to the smell of it because it is such a mold fighter. And if you have mold spores in your body, mold will tell your brain, don't like time. So if you can put a drop or two of time in your hands, rub it together, warm it up, cup it over your face and smell it, if that makes you feel like angry, like nauseous, anything like that, it's a bit of an indicator that you may have come across some mould because mould hates time. A lot of pathogens hate time. So if you have that aversion, you probably need to investigate that further. Wow. Um, Yeah, but I, I guess for thyme, since it's a very strong oil, perhaps we should dilute it right before we um, put oh, it on. Yeah, our- totally. Always in a carrier oil. Sorry, I should have said that. Always yeah. in a carrier oil. You don't want to ruin the pH of your skin with direct essential oils. Uh, they are so strong, but they will change the pH of your skin. So yeah, always in a carrier oil. Wonderful. All right. Thank you so much, Magic. Let's move on to your other um, expertise. You have a lot. <laughs> you are also... <laughs> A PNEI expert. Could you please share with us what does this mean? So PNEI is the psychoneuroendoimmunology of trauma. And basically it's the psycho, so the limbic system, the central part of your brain. And actually that's the one that mold attacks. So it's the psycho making something mean something. So it could be something that happened in your childhood, it could be something that happened yesterday, it could be your own thought patterns. It could be a pathogen that you're reacting to and you create an emotion and attach an emotion to it. Now, if this happens long enough in the body, as it does, you know, from childhood trauma or any trauma, uh, it's stored in the cells and then the neural system or the nervous system picks up the message. So the nervous system says, well, I might create pain here or I might create you know, random ticks in your face or your hand or whatever because I'm getting a message that the body isn't safe. So it's all about safety, all about homeostasis. So the neural system picks up the message. Now that goes right through the body, obviously. So if the neural system is sending these kind of changed messages around the body, endocrine system picks it up. So that's your hormonal system. You'll have you know, fluctuations in estrogen, testosterone, uh, progesterone, the whole thing, thyroid hormones. You know, the longer you are under stress or perceived to be in danger, the endocrine system kicks in. Now, unfortunately, it doesn't stop there. Once the endocrine system changes the balance in your body, the immune system, the big dog on the block, says, hmm, something's not right, body's in danger, do you know what? I'm the one that shuts all this down. So then you have an immune reaction and it might be uh, hives or it might be allergies or it might be joint pain, arthritis, or it might even develop to autoimmune or multiple or poly autoimmunity. And that's because the immune system's end of the line and it says, I have to stop this right now. So it will shut you down to keep you safe. And it's amazing as I hear you share about this. It's a domino effect that people don't really understand. It is. No system works alone. You know, it's, you cannot treat in isolation. You cannot treat a symptom. You cannot treat using reductionism because no system works alone. And one of my mentors, Dr. Perry Nicholson from Stop Chasing Pain, 
always has a quote that I love, and that is the body has absolutely no need to make any sense to you whatsoever. Wow. It has to do its job, and it's not going to let you know, and it's not going to ask you. It's just going to do its job. Very true. Um I also noticed that in the past two decades, we've seen a lot of like there's a rise of people suffering from autoimmune diseases or disorders. What are they exactly? And um, is this inborn or is this a product of an unhealthy lifestyle? It's both. It's actually, it's also a product of the body being in danger. So that can be inborn. So you can be born with a candida infection or a viral infection. You know, you can be born with trauma because as you're an egg in your mother's womb, uh, sorry, ovaries before you become something in the womb, you're inheriting her trauma traits because they're intracellular, so they're in the cells. But she's inherited hers from her mother. So something that you're dealing with might be generations back down the line, might not be yours. So there's one thing. But, you know, some of these autoimmunes, come because the immune system hasn't been able to do its job so it's kind of collected a whole lot of data and it's gone well i need to do this or this now where a lot of mainstream medicine people go off uh, off the the pathway of immunology is they say to people an autoimmune is your body attacking itself it's not the body does not want to do that an autoimmune is your body trying to find a pathway for you to survive and if that means that it's looking for say undigested proteins or it's looking for cholesterol because we know that cholesterol wraps around all our nerves viruses or viral cells steal cholesterol from our nerves causing nerve pain causing other issues so the immune system has to seek out these anomalies And that's what it's doing. It's not attacking you. It's trying to find the pathogen. Unfortunately, it needs to keep you alive. And if that means that you can't walk or your hair falls out or, you know, you develop this psoriasis on your skin, whatever, well, so be it. You're still alive. And that's what it needs to do. Amazing. It's my, I'm very enlightened. It's my first time to hear that bit about autoimmune disorders. But I'm also wondering, Magic, like how can essential oils support? Or I've also heard about generational trauma. Are there ways to release those using aromatherapy? Yeah, there are. And I actually use aromatherapy in my PNEI treatments with my clients. And I actually teach PNEI to other facilitators and practitioners so you know later we'll talk about how to get in touch send me a message I can put you in touch with that but yes essential oils are fabulous so one thing I say you know when I'm teaching the course and I'm happy to share this with you now is smells our olfactory sense has such a great uh, connection to our inner self our true self but also to our memories. So for me, I'll give you an example. If I smell dill oil, then that takes me back to my nana, who was my light, who was my saviour. She was like my favourite person in the world. And in a time when there was a lot of trauma going on in my life when I was young, she was the one standard because she would make her own dill pickle cucumbers. And she would have me in the kitchen standing on a stool because I was so little and she'd say, rub the dill on your hands and crush it and smell it and feel it and, you know, it's so soft on your hands and we will put it in the brine with the cucumbers and this is what we're doing. So now if I smell dill oil, I go right back to that spot, one of the happiest times in my life, even though everything around me was chaotic and traumatic, I can still remember standing on a stool making pickled cucumbers. I can still smell the dill. I can still see the whole kitchen. I can still feel her energy because of the dill oil. So it's just that strong that it can transport you to a really safe time. And remember I said the body wants to remain safe. So oils can do that. Now, some oils can have the opposite effect, right? So where there's a yin, there's a yang. 
And some oils might remind you of a time that was awful. Well, if that happens and that memory comes up, refrain from using that oil. Simple as that. Find one that connects you to a happy place. Find one that connects you to a happy time. You know, it might be a little bit of jasmine reminds you of springtime in the air when the jasmine's, you know, creeping up the fence and in, in bloom. Then do that. You know, it might be gardenia. It might be vanilla or, you know, whatever it is. Find some oils that work for you that transport you back to a happy, safe time. Oh, my gosh. I love your story with your Nana. That's really wonderful. And everything that you said, because there has been hearsay (laughs) uh, in aromatherapy groups that, you know, if you don't like the oil, it's something that your body needs, which I feel is very counterintuitive. What do you think? Yeah, I think that is counterintuitive. Well said. If you don't like the oil, it's telling you something. Like I said, with the thyme oil, a lot of people don't like it. Why? Because it's telling you something. It's not what your body needs. You do not create more trauma by inflicting an oil on yourself that makes you unhappy because that is going to cause a problem. So I'm very much of the opinion, use oils that make you happy, use oils that, you know, lift you up, that feed your soul, that transport you to a really good, clear place. Okay, so let's go back quickly to immune system. How do we treat our immune system and what are the things that we should avoid? Well, you should avoid any inflammation. That's the first thing. But it really depends on which type of immune system you are. So there's several types of immune system. You know, when I take people on an intake client intake, I'll find out which one they are. So there's no blanket treatment for an immune system. But the things that you do need to avoid, everybody, every single human being should be avoiding dairy. Dairy is the highest allergen causing or triggering food. Okay, it has a protein casein that the body cannot break down. Now, if you want to replace dairy, you just can't do without your milk go ahead and use goat milk because it's actually very, very close to the composition of human milk. So there's one thing. Dairy, definitely everybody should avoid it. The next thing, you know, we hear a lot about gluten. Gluten's evil, gluten's this, gluten's that. Well, gluten's a protein, just like casein, and it's not easily broken down. It's not really the bad guy, though. It's more the chemicals that attach to gluten the chemicals from processing, you know, the chemicals from treatment plants, the chemicals from growing the glutinous food, that's more your problem. But look, definitely gluten can be a trigger for a lot of people. So they're just two things that cause inflammation. But your thoughts cause inflammation. Saying, I don't like myself, I'm this, I'm that, you're causing or triggering inflammation. So look more inwards rather than blaming things outwards. Look more inwards. And like I said, it really depends on the immune type that you seem to be stuck in or, you know, that you present as, as to what you should avoid or what you should do more of. So it's kind of a little bit hard to delve into that one here with your listeners today. But if something makes you feel bad, stay away from it. One of my sons has an oxalate issue. Now, oxalates are a chemical composition that can get stored in the body so that your body feels safer from them. So if I offered him celery, he would probably scream at me. And he's been like that since he was little. Spinach is the same because they're very high in oxalates. Do I need to treat his oxalate problem? Yes, I do. But I need to also listen to him that my wanting for him to eat celery because it's so good for you, well, for him it's not, and his body tells us that. So listen to your body. If there's something that you don't like, don't go near it. You don't need to. We have such a vast array of foods available to us. Eat seasonally, first of all. If it doesn't grow in your backyard at the time of the year that you want it, don't eat it. Simple as that. But You know, we really need to listen to our bodies. And if we don't like something, there's probably 10 substitutes that you can use. 
Thank you so much for that. That is very true. And also, it's more sustainable if we eat foods that are in season, right? Totally. They've got the most nutrients, the most vitamins and minerals, you know, the most enzymes. If they're hot housed, they're not the same. They don't have the same properties for our health. Mm-hmm. Magic. I was also reading on this book about inflammation because I remembered you just mentioned you just mentioned that you know the jabs that we're experiencing with our immune system are actually forms of inflammation. And I'm onto this book. I'm not so sure if you're familiar with it. This is by Christine Herbert. And um, yeah, I'm learning more about um, like even cancer is caused by inflammation. Yes. Yeah, I'm sure you know this. Um, are there any tips that you can share with our audiences? Like what are the medical or pathogenic interventions that can affect our immune system negatively? Mm. Or positively if there is. Hopefully you still stay on air from this one, but uh, I'm sorry, vaccinations can affect your immune system. Uh, They drive a particular type of immune system so that they can't be broken down, otherwise they'd be completely ineffective. Um, And do you know what? They have chemical adjuvants in them, which our body can't recognise. In my opinion, as a natural health practitioner, I have to say to your listeners, you are actually better off catching something and building antibodies to it and allowing your immune system to do the job that it was designed to do then try and inject past it and not allow it to do that. So, you know, we see, I'm going on a limb here, flu vaccines year after year. We're injecting last year's strain. Then the next year, flu comes around. It's a completely different beast. It's a completely different viral cell. It's a completely different, you know, chemical makeup to the one that you injected last year. So that's what they do. We've seen it with bacteria as well. So, you know, we, we've heard in, you know, maybe the past two decades of superbugs. You know, you have to be so careful when you go to hospital that you don't get one of these superbugs. And they're usually strep or staph or variations of them. They never used to be dangerous. In fact, all of us have strep. All of us have staph. And it's meant to help us but we've turned it into superbugs because we used years and years of antibiotics. So we're telling it to, you know, sit down, do what it's told, not harm us, and it's just gone, no, I need to survive. So that's how superbugs are formed. So, you know, really there's a lot of things that we as humans do that aren't great for our immune system. There's a lot of things on the flip side that we can do to give ourselves the support. One of those is, you know, eating in season, drinking structured water, so not plain tap water, make sure it's filtered through minerals and using essential oils because guess what's going to knock all of these viral particles out, bacterial particles, fungal particles, your essential oils will. Wonderful. Um, good point that you made there. So does it, does it mean magic that you are not vaccinated right now? Uh, I had my childhood vaccinations. I had vaccinations till I learned what they actually did. Mm -hmm. I haven't had any since then, no. Oh, my gosh, also for COVID. Yeah. And I've I've had what people are calling COVID, and all I have to say to your listeners is that was the best two weeks of my life. I got (laughs) to actually lie on the couch and watch Netflix and eat grapes for two weeks. (laughs) So, you know, I don't normally, I'm I'm an A-type personality I do not normally take time off. I do not normally sit down and watch things on Netflix for, say, more than an hour. I might watch one thing and then, you know, I've got to answer my pants. I've got to keep moving, do something else. Well, I spent two weeks sleeping on the couch, getting up only to go to the toilet, getting my kids to bring me a couple of grapes because I couldn't eat much and drinking my water and watching Netflix. And I survived and I have natural antibodies now. And that for me, is a lot better than if I'd injected my body with something. Wow, your COVID experience is like a timeout for your hectic lifestyle. (laughs) It was so much a timeout. It was like you're on the penalty box of the couch and you stay there. And I did. And then I was fine. 
That is so good to hear. Here in the Philippines, we are required by the government to take the vaccine. So I had my COVID vaccine and the booster. Now, I like the point that you mentioned because I also had COVID earlier this year. And I like the point that you mentioned that we can't really have ourselves subject to the booster yearly because it doesn't really make sense. And I believe you. Um, right now, the government is suggesting for us to have our second booster. And I've been thinking, do I really need it? And like all the points would lead me to say that I really don't because I've already had my first series of shots, my first booster, and I've had my COVID. So I'm thinking, don't I have the antibodies for it already? Right? And I think well, you, that- You should have, technically, you should have the antibodies for it. And then I like what you said that, you know, if we're going to be subjecting ourselves to these shots yearly, then the viruses or these pathogens would just evolve into super versions of themselves. And I think that would be more dangerous, right? There's no, like, if that happens, um, we are just trying to catch up with their evolution. And do we really want that, right? So look, there's... There's a number of points here and, you know, I don't want your listeners to think I'm uh, going against what their government is telling them or anything, but there's a few things you have to ask yourself, okay? First of all is if these vaccinations work, why are the people that make them and why are the governing bodies such as the CDC, FDA, TGA, whoever your governing body is, why are they saying that after four months your immunity wanes and it's as if you are not vaccinated? So there's one thing. Why? Second of all, if you're getting these vaccines but you can still catch COVID, you can still spread COVID, what is the point of having them, right? Because they're not doing anything. I've heard people say, oh, no, but I'm glad I got my jabs because, you know, I didn't die. Well, I didn't die. And a whole lot of my friends that got it didn't die. In fact, I don't know anyone of my unvaccinated friends that has died or been seriously harmed by COVID for not getting a vaccine. But I have a long list of friends that are either no longer with us because they passed away from the vaccine, not from COVID, from the vaccine, or they've been injured from the vaccine and there's a lot of people out there now that have been mandated to get these things that are getting angry and I understand why they're angry because it doesn't stop you getting it doesn't stop you giving it so what's the point exactly yeah good point you know what um I have a friend who's had his complete dose the first two shots and still had COVID and so he thought Because here in Manila, we are given the freedom to choose, I think, from six brands of vaccines. We have a lot of choices here. So I think he he chose the earlier um, ones, which is um, from a country that, you know, maybe not that, not not from the U.S. Um, So he was thinking, oh, maybe I need, I should get a a U.S. branded vaccine. And so he did. After the first two shots, he got another set of two shots and still he had COVID. And just a few weeks ago, he told me, I'm, I'm having COVID again. It's my third time. And that's right. true. And right. I got it once. Yeah. Right? And <laughs> I haven't once. stopped living my life. I'm still out going to shopping centres and, you know, going where I need to go. And I've caught it once. And, yeah. you know, apart from a moment in time where I think there was probably an hour during that two weeks that I was actually scared, that's because my blood pressure shot up. So what I actually did was I raised my legs higher than my heart and I used some essential oils and had the diffuser next to me and had some essential oils in my water and I brought my blood pressure down. That was one hour in two weeks. Did I think I was going to die or I needed to go to hospital? No, because I knew what to do for myself. Okay. But it was two weeks of complete rest. I think the last time I had that, I might have been a baby sleeping in my crib. So, you know what? I've had it once. That is true. And I'm curious, Magic, what is the oil that you use to manage your blood pressure? Grapefruit for me. I love grapefruit for my blood pressure. I used to have very high blood pressure all the time. I got very much addicted to grapefruit. 
here it is <laughs> right next to me. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so that brings my blood pressure down and I just love it. Wonderful. All right. So could you please share with us, like, what are the, what do you mean, what is a pathogen and how do they work all um, within our bodies? So a pathogen is a virus, a bacteria or a fungus. Okay. There are others as in parasites, mold, things like that. We've already kind of discussed mold. Parasite is external pathogen that brings other pathogens into your body. But let's look at the big three, virus, bacteria, fungus. The three work symbiotically in our bodies, so they work together. If we take one group of them out by using, for example, antibacterial sanitizers and soaps and, you know, wipes and all that kind of thing, then we're causing an imbalance. So viruses eat bacteria and fungus, bacteria eat viruses and fungus, and fungus eat or destroy viruses and bacteria. And they all sit in our body and, and work together, all right? But they're supposed to keep their populations or their numbers down. When we take one out, we create this imbalance and something gets out of control. So you often hear, for example, people on antibiotics right? They took antibiotics and then they got thrush. So that's a fungal infection. That's candida. So the numbers of candida have gone up in your body because you took out bacteria that are supposed to keep them in check. All right. Or we hear of, uh, you know, post antibiotics, someone might get cold sores. Well, that's a virus because you've taken the bacteria out again and now you've got too many viral cells. And so they reactivate. So there's a lot of things there, but one thing we need to understand is that between 70 and 90% of our body is not human cells. It's viral cells, it's fungal cells, and it's bacterial cells. And they're all working together to keep us going. So again, trying to knock these things out permanently, not a great idea. That is true. I think we all know that there's good bacteria and bad bacteria. Like, um, I've also been hearing a lot about um, gut health. So could you please share with our audience a little bit about that and how it can support our immunity as a whole? Yeah, great question. So the gut is one of these barriers that I was talking about. And that's part of your innate immune system. Okay. So when your gut lining is damaged, or it becomes a leaky gut, starts off as irritable bowel, you, know, you eat something, you don't feel so great, you might get the runs, that's a sign something's going on in your gut, right? Candida is a gut infection, starts in your gut, travels right through the body, causes other issues. So our gut health is one of the first keys of defence, one of the first lines of defence, along with our skin, along with our blood-brain barrier, our nasal passages, and our private parts. They're all parts of the immune system, okay? But the gut is the one where if undigested proteins that I mentioned before get through gaps in the gut lining or gut wall, they travel through the body, and that is what sets off immune reactions. That is what your autoimmunity is because it's looking for these things that have escaped the gut where they're supposed to be categorised, processed, sent to the liver, broken down, you know, put into your furnace, which is your liver, and just gone, right, you don't mean anything anymore, now you're waste, you can be expelled. So the gut health is just so important. And things that trigger your gut health being poor, and we've spoken about them, high inflammatory foods. So things like dairy, some gluten for some people, some legumes for other people, nightshades for other people. You know, there's there's a lot of things, but you really do have to respect your gut. And it takes me back. I remember when I was still in the corporate world, I used to have, I was diagnosed with IBS quite often. And at that time, I was very young. I was in my early 20s. And I didn't really understand what IBS and what's causing it. And then later on, I realized it's stress. It's, it's amazing how um, something emotional and psychological affects our physical and I think this is what you do with your PNEI expertise right 
Totally. So stress is just one of those things that we as humans deal with. Other animals don't really deal with it. We give them stress. But, you know, if they were out in the wild, they would have short-term stress, they would deal with the problem, and then they move on, okay? We deal with it incessantly. And so what it does is it involves your adrenal glands and there's a number of pathways there, but the big one is cortisol, okay? So when you become high in cortisol, it changes the, um, the endocrine composition in your body so that's on that PNEI scale uh, but cortisol is not just a hormone it's also a sugar so you can test your blood and be high in blood sugars but it might not be glucose or glycogen that's the problem it could be cortisol so this is why we see a lot of people under stress get you know like a fat midriff belly kind of thing I have it I'm a cortisol junkie I have to say it you know I've been dealing with high cortisol for so long that my waist, I'll be lucky if I can wear a pair of jeans for a while working on it. But being exposed to high cortisol for so long triggers things. So your irritable bowel, when you're under stress from being in corporate, that was cortisol like waving through your body, like an, you know, like a big surf tide going through, just one roll after another roll after another. And it sets off a whole lot of things because cortisol is the most inflammatory hormone we have in our body. So it causes that inflammation. It causes that gut damage. And that's what your irritable bowel is. It's your body going, hey, I'm not happy. You're not happy. You might not want to listen, so I'm going to let you know. And this is how I'm going to tell you. Wow. Um, Let's talk about the lymphatic system because I know this has been um, popping up more often because of covid And um, could you please share with us why is the lymphatic system so important? So your lymphatic system is your waste removal system, okay? I started learning about it because I developed uh, lymphedema after a surgery. And so it's actually your waste removal system. Now, the lymphatics runs through your body along with the circulatory system like two wires next to each other. So imagine your headphones, okay? You go down from each earbud and you'll find these two wires together. Now you can break one wire. Your headphones are still going to work. They won't work the same, right? You're going to be cursing them the whole time going, I can hear out of one ear, what's going on? Well, your lymphatic and circulatory system are similar. So when you develop a blood clot or something like that from whatever cause it might be, going to push on your lymphatic system when you have a surgery most of your lymph nodes are sitting just under the skin so you're going to affect your lymphatic system now what mean what that means for the body is you can't circulate waste properly okay so everything gets classified by the liver whether it's a nutrient whether it's waste particle whether it can be reused or recycled and your lymph is no different that has to go past the liver and the liver has to say, this is good, this is bad, this can be reused, whatever. When the body can't get rid of things quickly enough, the lymphatic system travels around, it's closed loop, okay? So it travels around until the waste can be expelled. Now what that means is it is in fluid. So the lymph is, you know, full of sticky plasma-like fluid, all right? And all the waste is stuck in there. And if that keeps traveling around, it's going to find somewhere to settle to keep you safe. It's all about staying safe. So that might look like swollen fingers. It might look like, you know, a rough of what looks like fat but feels like water under your chin. It might be swollen feet at the end of the day. Or, you know, it might even appear not as swelling but as something like knee pain or lower back pain or neck pain and that is your lymphatic system saying there's so much waste here I don't know what to do with it I'm going to park it here and try and work out what to do and unfortunately it's a very ignored and misunderstood system of the body that is very true and I was wondering magic are there any activities or um, practices that you can share with our audience to promote lymphatic drainage Definitely. So I mentioned uh, grapefruit 
I absolutely love this oil. So grapefruit and ginger oil are great for helping the lymphatics drain. But there's a certain process, there's a certain pattern that you have to do to drain the body correctly. So anyone that does complex manual decongestive therapy or anyone that has studied under Dr. Perry Nicholson, who I mentioned before, and does lymphatic mojo, can teach you how to do this drainage properly. And there's a big difference between lymphatic drainage and lymphatic massage. Okay, so lymphatic drainage is what you need. As I said, there's a certain sequence that you need to do. These oils are great in a carrier oil because they get straight into the skin and they talk to the lymph and they hurry it along and they say, listen, you need to move this waste now. So, you know, it's a fantastic treatment and anyone can do it and it's a lot of fun too well all i can think of is dry dry brushing where does that fall (laughs) dry brushing is great again needs to be done in a certain sequence but dry brushing for some people could be a stress so you know if it hurts it's probably not going to be that great for you you are much better off getting proper lymphatic drainage with something that feels really relaxing, something that feels nurturing because that's not stressful. All right. Thank you so much for that magic. Is there anything else that you would like to share with our audience, perhaps invite them to your classes? Yes. So look, my team work 100% remotely, so we can work with people around the world. And you can find us at www.holisticnaturalhealth.com.au. Holistic with a W in front of it because we treat with holism, as I mentioned, so the whole body. We don't look in isolation at anything. And shoot us a message there and just say, hey, this is what I'm dealing with. We actually have a free intake call for people, so complimentary. And what will happen is when we get your message, one of the practitioners will send you out our intake form called Root Cause Analysis, and that's a 17-page intake form. And, you know, one of my clients the other day joked, it's like writing a thesis. Well, guess what? That's important. I'm not going to be asking you what's happened today and then treat that. I'm going to ask you what's been happening the whole time. So I can see that PNEI system, see if you've had mold exposures, you know, see what's going on, which systems are unhappy or which ones maybe need to calm down a little. And uh, so that's all free. And then we do a Zoom call with you to give you some answers. Now, whether you work with us or not at that point, that's up to you, but at least you walk away with some clear answers and some clear direction on what to do. I love that you do this remotely so you can actually tap people from anywhere in the world. Yep, and (laughs) if you're a practitioner out there and you want to learn about PNEI or advanced immunology or any of these things, we can put you in touch with our courses. Wonderful. So I guess that's all for today. Thank you so much, Magic, for being on the show. Thanks for having me. I will put in all your website, all your social media on this post so that our listeners can get in touch with you. And again, thank you so much, Magic. I hope to see you around. Thanks very much. Bye. Bye. Okay, so I guess that's all for today. If you have any other ideas or questions or topics that you'd want me to cover in my future podcast episodes, don't forget to shoot me an email at couchwasabi at outlook.com or slip me a DM on my Instagram at jlian85. And I hope to see you on my next Live Well with Aromatherapist, Jerby Cole.